Breaking tonight, Hurricane Ian unleashes its power along Florida's Gulf Coast. Do not be outside during this storm. Ferocious winds and heavy rains cause havoc while the storm surges could get worse. And residents of storm-battered Port Basque tell the prime minister what they need in person. Wards closed, patients in hallways, hospitals desperate for help. I have no See? staff today. Yeah, look, this is this is a sheet. Yeah. Blank, 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 blank. Exclusive access to a healthcare crisis. This is the National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thank you for being with us. Parts of Florida's West Coast are underwater right now and facing more danger tonight as Hurricane Ian churns across the state. So it blew in as a catastrophic Category 4 hurricane and it brought the sea with it. Enough water to swamp cities like Fort Myers and Naples. So Ian made landfall right around 3 p.m. local time, right near Fort Myers. The threat of storm surge spans most of the Gulf Coast, but along this stretch, Inglewood to around Naples, there's particular concern that it could reach five and a half meters above ground level. Paul Hunter is in Tampa, Florida tonight. So Paul, can you tell us what's happening there right now? Hey, Adrian, yeah, I'm in downtown Tampa, just uh, steps from the water. And actually, we're under a highway overpass so that we can uh, stay uh, safe and uh, dry while we're speaking with you. On the drive down here, we, we passed multiple trees uh, that had fallen on the highway, multiple power transformers that exploded as we drove by them. It is windy. It is rainy. It is nasty out there. In Punta Gordo, south of Tampa Bay, wind almost as fierce as it comes in these parts. And in so many places along Florida's Gulf Coast, familiar to countless Canadians who've holidayed here, evidence of Ian's wrath literally flooded the zone. This is Fort Myers. This is Cape Coral. This is a parking garage in Naples. Elsewhere in that city, a fire truck is immobilized in water too deep and too powerful. While just a few blocks away, what appears to be the roof of a house floating away. In Sarasota, the storm was so relentless, police were ordered to turn back. We just made uh, the decision just now to, to uh, withdraw all of our police officers from the streets just to, because of the sustained wind pressure. Florida's governor underlined the dangers in all of it, urging the millions in Ian's path to do whatever they can to get out of it. Overwhelmingly, uh, it's been that surge that has been the, the, the biggest issue. As the day progressed and as Ian punched its way inland, the biggest city along the coast caught a break. Tampa missed the worst of it, but Ian nonetheless left its mark. Just to give you a sense of what the storm has done to Tampa Bay so far, we've come down into Tampa Bay, into the bay itself, to see where the water line normally is. So all the water that would be here and throughout all of that space has been pulled out by the storm. It's all gone. Those living nearby couldn't resist the rarest of moments to venture to the bottom of the bay just by walking. You ever seen anything oh, like yes, this I've before? Heard, I heard it. I heard about it on the internet, but I had to come in person and see this. Look at this. I mean, this is crazy. A reminder that Hurricane Ian is a monster, even in places spared its full force. And yeah, Paul, this looks totally miserable where you are right now. It looks like it's going to be kind of a, a rough night for a lot of people. Yeah, and I got to say, it, it has stepped up in Tampa since uh, this afternoon. Uh, as you can see, uh, look, e even though this isn't the hardest hit part of Florida, the people of Tampa tonight are being told to shelter in place. Countless Floridians, Adrian, ignored orders to evacuate today. Tonight, they are inundating authorities with calls to 911 saying, come help me. It is going to be a long night. Who knows what Florida is going to wake up to tomorrow. All right, Paul, thank you. Be careful. 
So let's bring CBC News senior meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff in on this now. So, Joe, can we talk about the power of Hurricane Ian, both, I suppose, in terms of the water and the wind? Yeah, Adrian, Ian made landfall as a high-end Category 4 hurricane with sustained winds of 240 kilometers per hour. So this storm is now tied for the fifth strongest hurricane on record to strike anywhere in the U.S. and catastrophic storm surge continues overnight. I want to show you what this storm looked like when it made landfall. It's a very different storm, but with Fiona so fresh in our minds for comparison, the strongest winds at Fiona's landfall, 60 kilometers per hour lower than Ian. Let's zero in on that storm surge. So as Ian pushed inland, the storm surge near the center uh, will remain high and dangerous for hours. But remember that missing water in the Tampa Bay uh, beaches that Paul was showing us? We call that negative storm surge. So it's caused by the counterclockwise spinning of the storm, pulling water from the north and then funneling it, funneling it into the bays in the south. So really increasing the danger uh, right through the overnight, Adrian. Okay, so now that it's clearly still on the move, what are we expecting it to do? Let me show you the latest trajectory. Uh, it still has a long track ahead of it. It will begin to weaken before re-entering the Atlantic later tomorrow, and that'll help keep Ian as a tropical storm in those warmer waters before making a second landfall in the southeast U.S. coast uh, in the next couple of days and then tracking inland. So inland flooding, Adrian, still very much a big concern for millions over the next couple of days. Yeah, that's a staggering number. Johanna Wagstaff, thank you. You're welcome. Cuba is starting to restore power after Hurricane Ian plunged the entire island into darkness. This is the first time anyone can remember that happening. The storm hit there Tuesday, leaving streets flooded and hitting the country's tobacco farms really hard. At least two people are reported to have been killed by a collapsed wall and roof. The Prime Minister got an up-close look at Fiona's devastating aftermath in Port of Basque, Newfoundland today, where help is still desperately needed. We're now at close to $10 million in donations to the Red Cross, uh, which we've committed to match. So that's $20 million directly to Fiona Relief. Uh, but there's more to do. The Prime Minister toured the damage zone with Premier Andrew Fury, who announced $30 million in provincial aid. They spoke with local residents and first responders about all those challenges ahead. Some 150 troops are now in the province helping with the relief effort. Now, whatever the final cost ends up being, people on the ground need financial help right now, especially those who lost everything. Chris O'Neill Yates now on the crisis some are facing. <laughs> people are absorbing the pain of loss, at the same time wondering what now. Amy and Darren Osmond hoped for reassurance today from the Prime Minister that help is on the way. Where once the Osmond home stood, now just a pile of rubble. Darren was away working. Amy and their daughter got out just in the nick of time. We gotta, we gotta go. We gotta go. It's pretty terrifying. It was a, it was a hopeless feeling. <sighs> just last week, Austin Taylor finished putting on a new roof and siding. He's full of fuel. The smell, you know, the, the fuel is, is there. During Fiona, furnace oil leaked into his basement. Now Taylor's paying for his family, including a 29-year-old daughter living with disabilities, to live in a hotel. Everywhere he turns for help, it's the same. Leave a message, we'll call you back. We got no callbacks. The voice sits up all day with a phone ring, waiting for him to ring. When I came here, the water was coming in through here. Seven people used to live in this house. Terry Larish's dad passed down to him. On Monday, he says his insurance company told him He's not covered. I don't understand why they're doing it. So, I don't know, because the auditors act in nature or act of God, whatever it is, it should be included in your insurance. And the next day, he got another shock. He went into my bank account and took a payment out of my bank account for the insurance. So, you get the gall. And Larish can't rebuild on his own. He's laid off and on unemployment insurance. Osmond is hoping politicians will come through. They're saying that they're going to look after us, so that's all I can just take them at their word and hopefully, yes, I know it's a lot to say, but when you see it on paper, it'll be more, more assuring. If people were hoping for concrete answers about rebuilding, those didn't come today. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Port of Basque. 
And Ottawa is stepping in after Nova Scotia's premier took aim at Canada's big telecom companies over widespread system failures during the storm. There needs to be a serious discussion about how we make sure that the service is reliable, particularly 911. People frantically trying to reach loved ones and friends and neighbours and do wellness checks and, and certainly in some cases make 911 calls, which they couldn't. Four days after Fiona, some Nova Scotians still can't use their cell phones. In a letter to the federal government, Tim Houston slammed the companies for poor communication and a lack of transparency and called on the feds to intervene. It seems they heard him. Francois Philippe and I will be meeting with the CEOs of the telco companies later today. Disappointing is a mild, mild word for our view on the performance of the telecom providers in Atlantic Canada. It is just not acceptable. We will be making that very clear. The telecommunications industry has faced some tough criticism, especially after July's Rogers outage across the country. Tonight's meeting was not open to the media. Now, Fiona hasn't just turned people's lives upside down. It's also inflicted carnage on coastlines. Many beaches have been destroyed, with important sand dunes just washed away. Here's Kayla Hounsel on why that matters so much. This was Caribou Island in Nova Scotia's Pictou County before. Now all that grass covered with all that rock. A lot of this rock here didn't exist. It was down there all piled along that, those large rocks. Local resident and retired geologist John McLeod was here when Fiona roared ashore, battering the coast and scattering stone from this rock wall intended to protect against coastal erosion. Like these logs I see along here, that you could not see before it was covered in rock. That's right. In Oyster Bed Bridge on Prince Edward Island, around six metres of land, yeah, just yeah. gone. It was totally amazing how much sand came in. It just, how does that happen? Like, and just look at this. Satellite images from the Canadian Space Agency showing Fiona sucked the sand right off PEI's shores. It's now sitting in that cloudy water. This is the most impressive one to me. Chris Hauser is a coastal scientist. He's part of a program set up last year by the University of Windsor and Parks Canada that asks visitors to help track coastal erosion. You put your phone in the slot so that everyone is taking the exact same photo and use a QR code to upload it. This was Brackley Beach PEI before Fiona. This is Brackley Beach now. And what we saw was up to 10 meters of the dune completely eroded away. It's almost like somebody went through and cut the dune directly in half. He also says the coastline was vulnerable before Fiona struck. The last couple of years, we have not had the same level of coverage of sea ice. That protects the beach and the dune during the winter. And so we had a degraded state and we got hit even harder with Fiona. He says the dunes can recover, but it may take years and only if people stay away from them and allow the vegetation to regrow. Some parts of the Canadian coast will never recover. McLeod says these rocks need to be bulldozed back into place. In uh, normal times, without these extraordinary events, it, it works. The big question is what to do if this kind of extraordinary event is the new normal. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Caribou Island, Nova Scotia. An investigation is underway tonight as ruptured pipelines between Russia and Europe continue to leak gas. It's being called an act of sabotage. And as Briar Stewart explains, questions are being raised about Russia's involvement. Bubbling to the top of the Baltic Sea, gas leaching from Russia's Nord Stream pipelines. European officials believe this was the result of sabotage. Seismologists say they detected explosions south of a Danish island earlier this week. So it was clearly planned, big operation, in all probability, almost certainly a state actor behind it. What is uncertain, who is behind this and why? The Nord Stream lines, which run from Russia to Germany, are a key flashpoint between Europe, which relies on imported energy, and Russia, which stands accused of weaponizing its supply. Uh, Phillips O'Brien is a professor of strategic studies and believes the pipeline damage is just another Russian signal. We're going to do what we want to do. We're rather scorched earth, very dramatic, that we're willing to do something 
um, that you would not have expected us to do uh, and take desperate measures. The Kremlin calls those kinds of accusations stupid, but O'Brien says Putin has already signaled that the government is all in. It's mobilizing hundreds of thousands of men to try and hold on to Ukrainian territory. And it has staged what Western officials see as sham referendums. In recent days, hundreds have fled from the Russian-occupied territories, fearful of what comes next. No one wants to join Russia, no one. But with this pressure, people are scared. I didn't vote, says this man, because mostly everyone hides and doesn't vote in our settlement. In Red Square, it looks as if Moscow was getting ready to celebrate the annexation of the four territories. It's not clear when that will be or what happens after Russia sends all of these new recruits to the front lines. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Now to the UK, where after days of financial chaos, an extraordinary move to try to calm the markets. Today, a major intervention from the Bank of England. To try to stabilize things, it plans to buy government debt on, quote, whatever scale is necessary and at an urgent pace. Chancellor, what are you going to do about the turmoil on the markets this morning, sir? That turmoil began Friday when the government proposed $66 billion in unfunded tax cuts. That was meant to boost the economy, but instead it frightened investors and the pound tumbled to a record low on Monday. And then on Tuesday, some unusual criticism from the International Monetary Fund saying the plan will, quote, likely increase inequality, but the government is digging in. We think they're the right plans because those plans make our economy competitive. The opposition says the government has entirely lost control of the economy. I think we need to recall Parliament straight away. They need to abandon the budget. Liz Truss, who's been Prime Minister for less than a month, is under pressure to replace her finance minister. But media reports say she is standing by him. Now here at home, there's another reflection of a higher cost of living. University administrators say they are seeing a surge in demand at food banks from students. Julia Wong shows us their challenges and what schools are doing to help. Talova Tool arrived as an international student last November. I just moved here with just two luggages, leaving everything back home. And um, it was winter and uh, everything was so expensive. Some campus food banks across the country say they've seen demand soar. Inflation, rising tuition and higher living expenses means money for lots of students is tight. The stress is off the scale for them. We try to create an environment where they can focus on their academics, but if they're hungry, they can't do that. In the past, they might have, they might have reached out to family and friends for help, but everybody is feeling the pinch. So schools are getting creative, adding buses to take students to cheaper grocery stores. We're also increasing our uh, grocery bus program. So we have a grocery bus that takes students from uh, this area, which has some of the most expensive grocery stores in the city, to further uh, down where there are cheaper and more varied grocery stores. They're expanding breakfast programs. Food pantries filled with fresh fruit, dairy and other snacks are also popping up so students can grab what they need when they need it. I mean, it's great. I think the timing of, of this, you know, worked out really well um, for students. I don't think it could have came at a better time, to be honest with you. It's allowing students to save a little bit money at the grocery store by being able to come to our care cupboards and grab, um, you know, a quick bite to eat. As for Tool, she is now a volunteer at the Campus Food Bank because she knows what it's like to be hungry. It kind of gives you a sense of uncertainty and, and your mental health takes us toll. A toll these innovative programs hope to address by meeting students where they are. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. The Governor General was in Saskatchewan today to meet with the families of the victims of this month's horrific stabbing attacks. Sam Sampson brings us the scenes from Mary Simon's visit to James Smith Cree Nation. A solemn and personal start to the day. Governor General Mary Simon joining a private visit to the graveyard behind this church, paying respects to those killed during the rampage. Okay, the reason why we, we set up the memorial is because um, we wanted to honor our brother. 
The governor general also visited this memorial in the spot where Earl Burns died. His family says Burns chased down the attacker after being stabbed, but he died while driving and his vehicle crashed here. This is where he took his last breath. His family placed a cross here. Others have since added wreaths and flowers. I just felt um, thankful that he put that much towards the reserve that people came and, you know, paid their respects. Like he, uh, he did a lot for the community. Today has been a, a very important day for me because I came here and I understand much more about what the community is going through. This is the way that we start the journey of healing. Leaders here have been asking for help with addictions, treatment, policing, and to get a separate space for healing. As much as we are supporting the community now, uh, we will need to have ongoing support for the community over the long term because this kind of, of trauma and grief um, doesn't go away very easily. For now, people here are grieving. They're using traditional ways to rebuild their shaken, but not broken, community. Sam Sampson, CBC News, James Smith, Cree Nation, Saskatchewan. As hospitals across the country grapple with severe staff shortages, nurses on shift are hitting a breaking point. They're tired. They've been through a lot with the pandemic. Behind the struggle to keep the lights on at emergency rooms. A desperate situation that sees no end. My whole life is going as a refugee. There are no future for us. Why the Rohingya in India have been stuck in limbo for a decade and... Here's another shot, right by the sword! And and Remembering a legendary hockey series. I was in row 24 and C12. We're back in two. During this Truth and Reconciliation Week, many Canadians will take at least a bit of time to learn about the impact of the residential school system. But at some post-secondary institutions, that is happening each and every week. Deanna Sumanak johnson has details of a new wave of programs. Parliament passed Bill C-5 to create a day of commemoration to honour the survivors. This Indigenous Studies class is now compulsory for all undergrads at University of Prince Edward Island. One of the professors teaching the course says some students fresh out of high school may be surprised by what they learn. The racism that still exists, the inequality, the overrepresentation of Indigenous peoples in our federal prisons, uh, the impacts of Indian residential schools have created, it, it's, it's all new to them. Thank you. Perfect. This school year, UPEI and other institutions are going above and beyond to offer innovative courses that focus on Indigenous perspectives. And David Vera says everything changed a year and a half ago. Those unmarked graves uh, in Kamloops, BC, and then a number of other sites, I think that really struck to the core of what we have to do. After that, they realized things needed to change. For some institutions, that change meant compulsory courses in Indigenous studies and pouring money into new programs and courses tailored specifically to Indigenous students. Ava Ottawa, a former chief of her nation, teaches University of Ottawa's new French language Indigenous law certificate. Attirer les apprenants, les, les apprenants autochtones vers des études en droit et on veut les accueillir à partir des traditions, des ordres juridiques autochtones, à partir de leur bagage avant de faire le pont vers le, le droit civil. This man is taking Professor Ottawa's course to beef up his legal knowledge. If you don't have the credential, if you don't have this piece of papers, uh, people don't, uh, you know, necessarily want to listen to what you have to say. And while these new classes take different approaches, their goal is the same. Reconciliation, in one word. At the University of PEI, the new compulsory course seems to be popular. Once I become a classroom teacher, it will be something that I can just continue to widely spread and um, hopefully help future generations understand like what happened. I haven't stopped talking about this course to some of my friends and I think it should be a mandatory course across Canada. Making higher education a key step to reconciliation. 
Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Hospitals across the country are scrambling to keep their doors open. So we're going to be closing Section C due to a lack of staff this morning. We take you inside an emergency department where some days it feels like they are barely hanging on. Hospitals now say they need to hire 46,000 workers in Ontario alone just to maintain current levels of care. That is according to the union representing Canadian health care workers. Already, the struggle can be seen across the country. In recent months, some emergency departments had to close their doors. We saw that at a rural hospital recently. And then we were invited inside an urban hospital to witness the hectic, grueling reality firsthand. So we're going to be closing Section C due to a lack of staff this morning. It's 6.30 in the morning and a section of the emergency department at Kingston General is closing. Because you're short two nurses here. Short two nurses this morning. That means patients on the move immediately. So where are uh, we going? He's going to Delta 6. Okay. And you said some of these patients have been moved three times? Oh yeah. There's bed space in Section C, as it's called, but not enough staff to keep it running. So who's next, guys? The COVID positive there patient, the MRSA patient, or the has no isolation patient. He okay. could be a good hallway. Yep. Charge nurse Monica Griffin has to find space elsewhere in Emerge where the remaining staff can keep an eye on the extra patients. Quite a few will end up in the hallway by the time we're finished. It's not very nice. How you doing? No, I could be better in hurry. Okay. This young lady's been here in the hallway all night. Yeah, I've been in the hospital since uh, 11 a.m. yesterday morning. That's 20 hours in emergency so far for Missy Calvary, here for a broken ankle and waiting for surgery. In your mind, did you realize how busy it would be? No, I didn't. No, not until I came here and I seen it myself. I can't really sleep. People going by, always in people's way. Everybody's sweet here, though, so that's good. They, they definitely need more people. Basically, down here now is, this is what you see. It's empty. Ten empty beds that we can't use. It's like this all the time, or worse. This is just our regular day. Monica's 12-hour overnight shift is done. She hands off to Angela Arnold, just beginning an already awful shift. Um, no floats whatsoever coming. Oh, that means I have no See? staff today. Yeah, look. This is this is a sheet. Yeah. Blank, 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 blank. <laughs> Kingston Health Sciences is a trauma center, and for about half a million people in the area, it's where you'll likely end up if you have a heart attack or a stroke. And when staffing shortages happen here, they hurt, and not just in the emergency department. Thank you, Colleen, so much for coming. Are you covering breaks? Yes. Yeah, I'm covering breaks, okay. and I can stay till 7. Thank you. Nurse Julia Fournier is the program manager for the ICU. Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Her job is ultimately to keep the department up and running well, but that is getting harder. Any more sick calls come in? Um, Amy is not going to be here. Oh, no. She's tomorrow or Sunday. Okay, I hope she's okay. Yeah. Hi, good morning. I see the staffing. We are down to 17 this morning, which is very challenging. At the unit's daily staffing huddle, Julia reports that they only have about 50% of the people they need. I put out all the SOSs on social media and emails and texting and I'll continue to shift level as best I can. That's where we're at. Thank you. Thank you. Is that a good call or it's, I can't tell if it's a It's a, a good pretty day. typical call. We just try to plan for the next four hours. What's the next double we can make? So one nurse to two patient ratio. Is there a triple we can make, a one nurse to three patient ratio, which is never heard of in critical care. Does that mean you're worried about the care people are getting? I know the nurses provide excellent care, that's not, you know, but it's, um, it stretches them. I'm, I knew it was gonna happen. I'm so sorry. I do worry about them because of the, the, the moral injury and the moral strain. They're tired. I'll collect myself. They've been through a lot with the pandemic. 
yeah, it's hard. I have many conversations with them. Um, I worry about them. And then you take yeah. that on. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. It's really, really hard to see your team struggle like that. Yeah. And I look around your office here, and it's full of yeah. things people have said to you. You're doing an amazing job, your hard work and dedication. Yeah, they see it. And recognition is one of the ways that we support each other. Yeah, I care deeply for this team. Hello, it's admitting. And look at this. This space is basically the hospital's air traffic control. Do we have any surgical beds coming up? Any pending discharges for tonight? Uh, no, I've used everything I possibly can right now. We're finding bed space for patients seems just as hard as finding the staff to care for them. And do any of these floors have hallway or conference room patients? It's the domain of Renee St. Pierre. So we need to move them out of the ward room. A registered nurse for over 20 years before taking on this role full time. What do you see when you when you look at these screens? Which beds are empty? Who needs isolation? So we have medicine patients on surgical floors, surgical patients on our perinatal floors. Like we're just trying to fit people in where we can, um, especially when emerges in a crunch, we just move people up. Sometimes it's to hallway spaces. We've opened up beds that are that used to be um, storage rooms. So now that they've revamped them and opened them up into patient care areas, so it's not just these things here. These are all patients that are either waiting in the community or at another hospital that are waiting to come to our to facility. To be transferred here? Yeah. So this is another place that, um, that kind of gets missed, I think, when we hear about all the things that are getting dropped in healthcare right now is they're waiting at home for this bed. So those two privates, do we know if any of one of them are going to be going home anytime soon? Amy Dawn Asford and Brenda Hutchins work the phones, checking every department, every unit for a safe space. Hi, it's Renee. So yeah, we don't have any beds. So we'll have to move someone from your floor. Is there anyone going home that we could actually cohort those two MRSAs in a semi? No, okay, yeah. thanks. Okay, bye. Time to head back to the emergency department with Renee. Just gonna let them know where we're at with beds because we're physically just don't have any beds left. The ER is busy today, like really busy. Yes. So that's not the answer they need, right? No, it's not what they want to hear from us, no. Oh, wow. Okay, there's people everywhere so right now. Hey, Andrew. So just coming down to give you an update on beds. Going into tonight, there is going to be two ICU beds. Looking and hoping for some more surgical discharges um, to get anyone else out, but there's going to be one bed there. Other than that, med surge is pretty much full now. Hi there, it's Angel Charge. So that's a doctor calling to let her know there's okay, another patient that needs to come right. to us. Gonna put one right beside the desk where there's one vacant spot. If you look around right there, there's yeah, there's one space right by the admin desk. Yeah. That's, so that's it. There's literally nowhere else to, to go. I need uh, nurses and uh, rooms. Okay. So is there anything that I can realistically get you today? No. No. Okay. We've known this was coming. We've warned that this was coming. Dr. David Messenger is the head of emergency medicine. He says the system has been starved for years. We've really become the door to healthcare for so many people who can't access it in any other way. A patient group that's getting older, no one banked on two years where those people wouldn't be able to see a doctor. Right. So things are getting worse. Things are getting worse. Um, people are getting sicker. So the good ideas almost always come from the people whose boots are on the ground. What's even a little thing that would make life better? We've struggled for so long to find more efficiencies in the system so that we can help people move through the system faster, more effectively, more efficiently. We need system level solutions. We need change that would allow enhanced scope of practice for different types of care providers. So There's still no way to open up C though. I'm going to open it up with one nurse. With one Hopefully nurse? Hopefully keep it going with one nurse. Just one nurse means Section C can open up for the night. Still, there is a dread about what tomorrow will bring. You leave here and you think it can't get any worse, and it does. Like, you know, how much more can you take? But somehow they seem to just make it through. 
Somehow we were able to gather together and make sure that the sickest gets treated, and they will. If you're the sickest, you're gonna get in. Somehow we make it happen. Now the exhausted staff there in Kingston, but also across the country, are bracing for another potential COVID wave combined with the coming cold and flu season. But they do have some creative solutions to try to relieve some of the pressure on the system. We'll have that story for you in the coming weeks. Now, next on The National, the sudden death of a Toronto actor. This is my grandson, Finn. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. The tragic accident that cut his life short. But first, the Rohingya living in camps for a decade in India. Why there's no solution in sight. India is threatening to expel Rohingya refugees living in a tent city in Delhi. They fled Myanmar years ago to escape a campaign of violence launched by the military. Their life in India since then, very difficult. And now, as Salima Shibji shows us, any hope for a better life is all but gone. At the edge of Delhi, a desolate camp. Homes cobbled together with whatever materials the dozens of families who live here could find. It's a life unsettled, a daily struggle to get clean water in a place that has no toilets and little dignity. For a Muslim minority that fled persecution in Myanmar only to find destitution in India. For many here, like Mohammed Salimullah, the community's years-long plight stings. He shows me the narrow tent he shares with his wife and two children. In Myanmar, we were oppressed, he says, so you could call this freedom. But just look around. The heat is stifling. There are snakes when it rains. The young children are frequently sick, he says. Their future is bleak. Now we don't have nothing. No. A thought we repeated by this 16-year-old who's been here since my he was five. Life, my whole life is going as a refugee, so I'm feeling very bad. I'm, I think, ma'am, there are no future for us. Whenever some people go to go find a work and uh, they deny it because they said, they said you are not Indian and you don't have documents, so we cannot provide you a job. The threat of eviction also simmers in the air. It's a big worry for Miza. With two younger siblings, the 20-year-old has always dreamed of becoming a doctor. But it pains her to know she can't, without citizenship documents or any security. Our tent burned down. I lost everything, all my books, she says, when fires repeatedly ripped through the camp. This camp has been here for 10 full years, and in all that time, very little change in the conditions here. The Rohingya in India have unclear status and very little documentation, leaving them in the most precarious of positions. India describes the Rohingya as illegal foreigners, and the government wants to deport them back to Myanmar. Last month, a minister promised to dismantle these camps and provide proper housing. But the Hindu nationalist BJP government swiftly shut that down and threatened to move the families to a detention center. I mean, the government of India is taking a very hard line. Security the issue, experts say, is India doesn't have any policy on refugees. It's ad hoc and can be bent at will, based on religion. If you do not have a refugee law, a refugee policy, you cannot claim yourselves to be a civilized country. Absence of policy or absence of a law has basically helped the government of India to adopt discriminatory policies and put all the refugees at risk. It leaves those here feeling helpless and unwelcome, even on rare days like this, when a fishmonger passes by with food that reminds them of home. A small glimmer of good in a daily struggle for basic rights that threatens to overwhelm. Salima Shibji, CBC News, Delhi. After the break, it was the goal of the century. Here's another shot. Fight by the score. We meet the lucky fan who had the rare chance to see the Summit Series in person behind the Iron Curtain. And I do think it's definitely a little bit strange. A brother and sister's coincidental connection to Nova Scotia's most destructive hurricanes in our moment. There's 
some breaking news tonight out of the U.S. Rapper Coolio, one of the biggest names in 90s rap, has died at the age of 59. According to his manager, he died at a friend's home in Los Angeles, the cause not yet determined. Coolio won a Grammy for the song Gangsta's Paradise. He was nominated several other times during his career. Canadian actor Robert Cormier has died. He played the character Finn Cotter on CBC's Heartland. This is my grandson, Finn. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Cormier's pensive, charming portrayal earned him fans last season and raised expectations for coming episodes. Thank you for giving us a shot. Cormier also had a role in the third season of the Netflix drama Slasher. His budding career was cut short on Friday. Cormier's family says he died in a Toronto hospital from injuries suffered in a fall. He was 33. Well, today marks precisely 50 years since Canada won the summit series against the Soviet Union. The on-ice clash at the height of the Cold War was a national moment. A lot has changed since then for the countries and the game of hockey, but Jamie Strachan shows us that for those who were there, the way it bound players, fans, and the country together endures. Here's another shot, fight by the Many Canadians who were alive in 1972 can tell you exactly where they were for the goal that wove its way into the fabric of a nation. I was in row 24 and seat 12. Jim Herter was actually there. I watched the milestones come and go and always wondered, uh, you know, whether I'd be here for the 50th. He's one of 3,000 Canadians who traveled to Russia to attend the last four games of the series. And we were cheering and happy, and everybody was saying, go Canada, go, go Canada, go. And we looked out at uh, shoulder to shoulder of military. And Herder recalls what happened inside the arena when Russian soldiers tried to confiscate a trumpet being played by a Canadian fan. Every time it started to look like it was in danger, we'd hand it. And, and it started to bond us. We started to realize it's us against them. Going into the third period of the final game, Canada trailed 5-3. We were chanting, next goal wins. All of us. The handshaking Team Canada. Canada, of course, tied the game, and the rest is history. I was still a Newfoundlander. I still am, first. It was really the first time I felt Canadian. The players on the ice still nod to the role the Canadian fans in Russia played friendly faces in an unfriendly place. The Canadian national anthem has never been sung with more fervor and vigor. And we're standing on the blue line, and honest to God, there was bumps on your arms. The puck's a, a fabulous piece. Herder, too, relishes the memories from those 10 magical days spent behind the Iron Curtain. Right by the door! 50 years later, they're as fresh as ever. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Now you are looking right there at a brother and sister named, wait for it, Dorian and Fiona. Now to any Nova Scotian, their names are now very familiar, symbolizing destruction and chaos. Dorian and Fiona are the last two powerful storms to hit the province. The siblings were born before the storm, so this is just a wild coincidence, but it has not stopped their friends and family from having a bit of a laugh at their expense. The stormy siblings are tonight's moment. Who knew? Just a couple of names and a weird coincidence, but here we are. I deliberately picked unusual names for them. So the fact that I picked unusual names, I think just made me this much more surprised that those names happened to fall one right after another in the list of hurricanes that hit Nova Scotia. I do think it's definitely a little bit strange. And I've been hearing from friends, just how does it feel to share the same name as this big hurricane? And like my mom has been sending me headlines where they don't specify hurricane. So it's just Fiona destroys Atlantic. Just the ones that are funny out of context. Out of the two of us, Fiona, she has been somewhat of the more aggressive one, I would say. And then... Like, not, not to be mean or anything. 
that's probably the joke that I get the most from people who are texting me and messaging me on Facebook is, do you have any children hidden away that we don't know about that we should be aware of? The answer is no. No, and there won't be any more. No, but there is a cat, and the cat's name is Daisy. So, you know, if there's a Daisy storm, then there's something really weird going on here. That is the National for September the 28th. Have a good night.